All right. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks very much for uh, for uh, being here, and um, you know, thanks uh, to uh, Stuart for for having me. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> So uh, title of the talk, uh, Incorporating the Security Development Lifecycle and Static Code Analysis into Our Everyday Development Lives, uh, Overview of Theory and Techniques. And I apologize in advance for using Windows on my laptop, I'm sorry. Um, so, and uh, thanks for uh, HP uh, for supporting my travel here and, um, and also uh, to my uh, family for allowing me to <laughs> be away and come. <clears throat> so a little bit about me real quick. Um, I'm a consultant with Hewlett Packard Enterprise Services. I work um, mainly for U.S. public sector uh, uh, entities. And um, <clears throat> uh, unfortunately, I don't get to uh, develop uh, uh, open source as my uh, full time uh, um, gig. However, I like to dabble in my uh, part time and I do a little security research on the side. So I really hope I'm not preaching to the choir. Uh, uh, sorry. I <laughs> uh, hope I'm not. Um, I hope I'm preaching to the choir, I should say, about this topic and that everybody's already <clears throat> kind of uh, got a, a security mindset for a project and, and have a, um, a set of uh, tools that they're using in terms of uh, code analysis and uh, processes in general. But like the, uh, the picture here from my rental car uh, shows with the keep left, uh, sometimes it's uh, good to talk about the obvious uh, things just to make sure that, uh, you know, <laughs> something's not forgotten. <clears throat> so as usual, I have more slides than I have time, so some of this I'll be uh, moving kind of kind of quickly through. <clears throat> uh, I want to start with just giving a few uh, good resources on these topics. Um, uh, the, the, the best one <clears throat> that I've seen uh, that is just out on the internet, the uh, Open Source uh, Web Application Security Project, uh, OWSAP. Uh, check that out for sure. Um, give you a lot of good introductory materials on um, <clears throat> developing secure software, implementing um, uh, security development lifecycle in general, and a list of tools and that kind of thing that you can use. Uh, the uh, the books mentioned there are pretty good. Um, the uh, if you're interested in the internals of um, static code analysis, uh, the the book there by uh, Brian Chess and Jacob West from HP are, is is pretty good. <clears throat> and then I, I'd like to um, also mention Caverity. They have a uh, open source uh, scan uh, cloud service that a lot of open source products are already using. It's really nice of them to do, um, and it's uh, it's. It's uh, great. And then I um, uh, have to give a plug to HP as well with their Fortify on-demand service. <clears throat> so let's face it, it's been a bad year for security and open source. And I'm not here to pick on any uh, particular projects or point a finger. I'm certainly, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> would make mistakes uh, as well. So, um, but, you know, so don't take offense if you're, uh, if you're part of any of these projects. But here are a couple of uh, headlines that we've all are aware of um, from this past year. Um, obviously, the open um, SSL heart bleed, um, uh, some problems found in Drupal uh, with SQLI, and uh, of course the bash of vulnerability shell suck. So we really can't uh, sit here and, and shake our, our finger anymore at the uh, closed source giants like Microsoft and say, hey, without pointing it at ourselves and say, hey, what can we do better um, in terms of uh, improving the security and the stuff we're putting out there as well. <clears throat> So I was stuck in the Hong Kong airport for 26 hours because I had a, missed a flight and I saw this sign. So hopefully um, I needed to incorporate it in my slides somehow. Uh, so hopefully 2015 uh, we're not going to be uh, sheep and we're going to make things better. <clears throat> and uh, so some of the traditional assumptions about open source uh, are kind of, uh, they're just uh, proved that, you know, not, not really working all that well. I mean, many bugs, uh, many eyes make all bugs shallow, for instance. Um, it, it is really valid to a large extent, uh, having source code out there available for everyone to, to see. But it kind of begs the question, who, who's reviewing it? Uh, is anybody reviewing it? Um, certainly uh, there's some of that going on, but um, you know, the, the best people to, to review this code are, are the developers um, that are writing it if they, and um, the people that are really familiar with the project themselves. And a, a good uh, quote there right from Wikipedia is, at, at one time, um, this open um, firewall toolkit had a, uh, 2,000 sites using it, but only 10 people gave him feedback. So, and then old code is stable is another. Um, and, you know, with the bash water, but it, that problem has there, been there for years. Um, and then firewall, yes, will protect us from our bad coding practices. Is um, not true for zero days, and uh, which we're seeing, of course, more and more of. And um, component-based software development and frameworks are more secure. Uh, they've definitely uh, helped improve the situation uh, quite a bit by removing some common um, problems. But it introduces a whole other set of problems uh, where you now bugs are um, perpetuated across the large uh, set of systems a lot quicker. 
And uh, with component-based uh, design, it's, it's, it's hard sometimes to keep up to date with all of the, um, the uh, vulnerabilities and, and the components that are used in the build your code. So who's to blame and who can help fix it? Uh, uh, I think, um, you know, all of us, <laughs> we're all on the hook uh, to make things better. And I think it is something I'm kind of passionate about. Um, I think it's a failure to educate to a large extent, too. And I'm not trying to pick on the local university here. This is true for every uh, software engineering class you probably can think of. But if you look at the syllabus, uh, you don't see anything about security engineering. And, and that's, really, um, that's really a failure that, that needs to be addressed. Uh, I'd like to see um, students uh, have to be also graded on uh, if they're not only that the code compiles, but that it uh, doesn't have you know glaring security uh, problems with it, <clears throat> especially when you get into you know web development and, and such. So how can we fight back? <clears throat> um, as I already said, security-oriented developer education is kind of probably number one. Um, so there's been a lot of pushes uh, in the corp um, especially on the corporate side for this uh, security development life cycle. Trying to apply that to open source get its own set of challenges, but <clears throat> it's something that I think every project needs to consider how they can do. Um, organize strong security teams. Uh, be ready for incident responses because they're going to happen. Um, and, uh, and I mentioned Drupal earlier in my uh, uh, list of vulnerabilities for the year, but they did a, a great job, their security team, of, of uh, getting the, um, the fix out the door quickly and making everybody aware of it the best they could. Um, and that's, that's kind of key. And um, yeah, make your updates as, as easy as possible. Um, encourage use of tools to manage dependencies and, uh, judi and judicious use of uh, automated analysis um, through uh, static code analysis and um, human code inspection. Definitely key. And you know, empower a developer and include security in everything we do. Um, so if we're not examining the code, uh, who is? <laughs> so uh, there's, a, there's definitely other uh, entities that are looking at source code and uh, they have their own set of motivations, uh, hackers. Obviously, um, you know, some of them are out there just to be able to say they did it. Um, I recall this, this talk at DEF CON uh, a couple years ago. A guy broke a Google TV uh, firmware update process, and he was calling the engineers a bunch of idiots. And I was thinking, you know, it's a lot easier to destroy it than it is to create, so that's not really fair. But you don't want to be a guy being called an idiot, so you want to uh, <laughs> try to be, be ahead of these guys. And, um, you know, security research companies, um, you know, they ultimately need to monetize what they're doing. Uh, they need to um, <clears throat> in firewall products or application containers and that kind of thing. Um, and uh, academia has got a publish or die mentality. <clears throat> so they might not have your, your interest uh, in mind. And uh, your friendly local intelligence uh, community, um, you know, they don't need backdoors. Uh, everybody says, oh, they're putting backdoors in our software. It's uh, a lot harder to get backdoors in the software than it is to simply exploit problems that are already out there and for everybody to see in the code. And you might not have time to do a thorough security review, but you can bet that these guys are. <clears throat> and that should give you a warm fuzzy. So uh, who else uh, should but might not, not be doing it? As I already said, uh, developers are writing code really the best defense. But if they don't have the knowledge and the tools, they're going to miss things. If you're prod you need to have an overall um, system architect that really knows what he's doing in terms of security. because. Uh, you know, you can uh, have tools that are going to find bugs in, in code, but uh, they're going to miss things in overall architecture flaws. <clears throat> and uh, again, don't depend on your project security team. Uh, take, uh, take initiative if you're a developer to make sure your code's secure. Uh, I'm oh, sorry. Um, yeah, who else should? <clears throat> Companies, uh, I believe, have an obligation. If they're using open source, they're um, putting it into their products, they're making money off of it. Um, I think they have an obligation to try to make the security better, to try to, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe put their will um, onto the, uh, the, the community to an extent to enforce some security standards. Um, and then if you're offshoring development, uh, offshore developers uh, might not uh, be up to date on some uh, security stuff, so you definitely want to um, <laughs> be reviewing that code. Quick example uh, uh, shown here is a, uh, there was a talk at uh, Black Hat and DEF CON this past year by MITRE. Uh, UEFI firmware um, exploit that um, if you're running Windows 8, which hopefully none of you guys are, um, it uh, can um, basically uh, flash your firmware with a, uh, with a, um, a malicious um, agent that is persistent because it's in firmware. And they, they looked through the, and how they figured out how to do it is they looked at the EFI, um, UEFI um, uh, DEK uh, code that is out there, Intel published it put it out for everybody to use the review. 
all the companies, HP included, used it. They don't, didn't look at it. You can see right here there's some comments, uh, make more checks later. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think companies that leverage this could really do have, a, have a, um, an obligation to kind of look at it for themselves, too. So there's a lot of inherent difficulties. I probably don't have to say too much about this. I mean, if you look at a project, a lot of, been a lot of talk here about OpenStack. You have thousands of people contributing to it. <clears throat> you know, you can't really enforce a, uh, uh, easily enforce, I should say, a, a true security development lifecycle. So you really got to try to catch things, um, you know, before you put out official builds and such. But if you're working on small projects or you're working on projects for your company, then you really do have a chance to implement a good uh, process. Um, so there's a number of trends that are kind of helping and hurting. Um, so we're using more frameworks, APIs, um, and uh, you know these are removing common security problems. Uh, but again, uh, lazy admins and, and time delay in implementing patches are, are problems. Component-based design, I already mentioned, um, can be a problem with version management for uh, affected versions. Uh, rapid development life cycles. Um, is, is great for getting uh, things out to customers, but uh, it might not leave time for adequate security testing. Um, so there's a lot of good resources out there, but you know not all developers have equal knowledge. Um, there's security researchers that are really looking heavily at open source, but they might not give uh, enough time. And uh, tools like static code analysis are being used on an increasing basis, uh, but it doesn't cover everything. And a lot of times it's not used until the end, where it'd be really nice if it's in the hands of the developers that are working on the code. They can check themselves before they submit, um, before they submit code. <clears throat> so more trends, there's, um, uh, yeah, identifying security issues uh, after it's done. It's, it's a costly way of doing things. And in the race condition, IP gets stale quickly. We all know that. So uh, we want to get cool things out quickly. Security is in a future release, et cetera. Um, and then the changing threat landscape, we're talking about like you know, nation state um, advanced persistent threats. Um, and embedded systems is just a mess when you think about <clears throat> all the, the things that are out there like phones that they don't, um, companies have no motivation to create updates for, but they're still out there connected to the network. So uh, advanced persistent threats, as I already mentioned, is uh, this changing threat landscape that we always hear about. So you know, uh, we need to kind of look harder at the um, Past traditional defenses to uh, in order to to um, you know try to in some way counteract the, this threat. And a good example there at the end was a quote from uh, Owen uh, O'Malley from uh, one of the Hadoop designers. He was saying that the security design really had nothing to do with actual hackers, and because it's going to be behind firewalls and such. And you know that assumption is just not true anymore because you know uh, with the APT, uh, you know they'll find a way around firewalls and whatnot. And then the last level of, uh, of defense is you know is in the in the code base, and uh, you might as well do the best you can to try to keep them out. Um, uh, Caverity published a, a pretty good report. I recommend reading it. <clears throat> it's uh, from last year. Um, they uh, are scanning a number of open source projects, um, and uh, here's a couple of highlights that uh, for the first year, um, open source had a less uh, density of uh, defects than their um, proprietary code that they've scanned. And they also had a kind of interesting, um, they've been scanning uh, the Linux uh, kernel for a number of years. And uh, you can see in 2013, they've, more defects were fixed than were uh, introduced. Uh, so shows that um, backlogs are getting to. These numbers are kind of funny too because um, what they've identified these defects, the developer might have decided aren't defects or they have a risk mitigation strategy. So on to the SDLC, um, well, uh, security development lifecycle or secure software development lifecycle. <clears throat> so there's a lot of formal approaches, there's, um, uh, but they all have kind of like the same goal in mind. Uh, basically, um, you know, try to, uh, to get security into each stage of the, your development process. Um, and who, can, who should contribute and where? <clears throat> uh, everybody has a role uh, from the system engineers, developers, testers, and a security team. Um, it's kind of critical that, that everybody uh, have a security mindset. Uh, so here it is in a, in a nutshell, in graphical format at that. Um, th so no one likes to do it, but uh, <laughs> it really needs that you have uh, uh, requirements uh, uh, that are, um, also include security. Um, the, you know that initial phase of, of trying to figure that out is uh, is often skipped when you're making you have an organic um, kind of open source collaboration. But uh, you might even need to go back and try to retro retrofit it. But it's uh, it's definitely a good first step because that leads into you know your design phase, 
where <clears throat> you're trying to get your data flows and figure out how things are, are going to interact. And if you don't have that figured out, you, know, you, you can't implement the, the next kind of principle, which is threat modeling. Um, and then, uh, of course, going on to coding, um, having developers that are trained uh, in good coding practices and using static code analysis during development or, or at least at the end of it. And um, uh, testing that includes um, uh, vulnerability testing. So if you have good requirements designed, you can trace your security requirements and your uh, threat model to test. Um, so you have a traceability matrix. Uh, do fuzz testing um, as well on top of that. Uh, testing might be a place where you're running your final static code analysis too and generating a report, make it, you know, to review. Um, and then uh, the deployment, um, making sure you get good documentation out that, that explains, um, you know, the proper way to configure it if you want it to be secure. And also, uh, there's no reason not to publish the threat model, the risk model, all the other documentation that you have so somebody can make a, a good independent analysis of what they're getting into. And the image on the bottom is, is Microsoft's version of this. It's, it's pretty similar. They threw in a uh, training uh, step as well and uh, response phase. So you definitely want to have an you know, incident response uh, plan as part of this as well. <clears throat> um, so there's a couple different methods of, th of threat modeling. Um, but long and short of it, you know, you, you need to um, uh, have your, your data flows figured out and your user interaction or your security requirements. And then you kind of try to reason about it. And Stride is a way to do it from uh, Microsoft. Um, Dread is a threat, rank, threat ranking um, uh, system that they have. And uh, they're, they're actually pretty good ways to, to try to figure it out. But um, the general process, you're going to decompose the application, uh, determine the various threats. Um, and then you're going to uh, try to determine whether you're going to fix it somehow in code via countermeasures or if you're going to mitigate it via some other mechanism like document, you know, document the, th the threat so somebody knows that they, need to they know that it's there. Um, <clears throat> so here's a data flow diagram that they've started to, um, to add a, uh, um, uh, I guess, um, sorry, security boundary layers <laughs> to the uh, dotted red lines. And then uh, here's a stride. Um, uh, it stands for spoofing, tapping, uh, uh, non-repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege. And you know, basically, you go for each of these categories and think, think of ways that uh, your particular um, uh, code could be uh, susceptible to to these various types of attacks. And I don't have time to go into this, but this is an example of what I did for Hadoop for another thing. But you can see. Essentially, um, you know, go for each thing and try to figure out the weaknesses in the design. Um, uh, another uh, thing you might want to do is uh, <clears throat> try to um, um, document attack paths because and um, root causes of the threats that uh, that uh, that are there, and uh, then also kind of um, uh, try to document what you're going to do uh, to 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 um, counteract that. And then uh, use cases, you can turn into use and abuse cases if you, if you bother to create those. <laughs> this is a good example of why it's good to do all this work in uh, documenting um, because it makes it easier to see uh, the various ways that you know, a hacker uh, shown here could uh, try to abuse the uh, use cases of the system. Uh, you want to um, uh, try to rank the threats in, in, uh, in kind of terms of their likelihood. Dread is an example of how to do that. Um, that stands for damage, for, um, rep uh, re can't talk, <laughs> reproducibility, uh, exploitability, affected users, discovery. And you, uh, the, the idea here you can read about is you assign a numeric value and then you kind of come up uh, with a, um, essentially a, uh, a priority of what you're going to address and what you might not address if you don't have the time. And uh, don't dis dismiss the small stuff. You know, something that might seem small when you're working this out, it, um, it might not be. And uh, I, I have a, a silly little uh, example here. <clears throat> and Explain what's going on. My uh, my uh, my three-year-old is in a preschool uh, program at a at a small Catholic school, and uh, the local utility company had a uh, contest where you know they created some sort of video about you know, not electrocuting yourself on a down power line and whatnot, and they had a site where you can vote for who's the best one, but the winner gets eligible to win ten thousand uh, dollars for the school, and I hate stuff like this because to me it's a popularity contest. Obviously, the small school is at a disadvantage to the big school. And uh, so it says they limit you to three votes per day per IP address. Well, when my wife voted and she told me to vote, I was like, well, I shouldn't be able to vote because it's by IP address and we're behind a NAT. We have one IP address. Well, of course, that wasn't the case. All they're doing is uh, using a, uh, a cookie 
and uh, accepting uh, unvalidated inputs. So all you had to do was pass. You needed to get a valid session, and then uh, um, simply uh, um, uh, it made an AJAX call to a uh, to a you know to a post to a form um, to uh, submit your vote. So a little W get script, and thousands of votes later, uh, they're in the finals for uh, for for that. So as an example of you know they probably figured nobody was going to bother doing that, or they didn't know what they were doing. The really the only way to, to actually implement a voting system like that is to have a user account, and they probably didn't want to do that. And uh, they ranked that th threat low. And their countermeasure was having a review process after the votes were submitted to actually determine the winner. So a uh, small, stupid example. <clears throat> uh, but testing is a definitely a golden opportunity. If you don't do it anywhere else, you've got to try to catch it there. Uh, you definitely want to try to, to, to have security oriented a test as part of your unit test. Uh, do fuzz testing when you can. Um, and if there's a separate uh, test team, make sure they, they know the threat model, have access to all the documentation, that kind of thing. Check out the, uh, the OWASP uh, link for testing guides, pretty good. Uh, what about Agile? Um, well, a key point uh, Agile makes things a little bit harder, um, but it also uh, uh, makes things. Uh, uh, I don't know, maybe a little bit easier in some extent, but um, you know, you still got to try to shoehorn the security in there, uh, whether it's during major design reviews, um, and definitely any any uh, final release uh, that's going out. So there's a lot of uh, uh, research out there about how to get this fitted in. So if you're doing agile, be sure to read that. We definitely don't have time to talk about this, but be aware of the uh, the uh, secure coding. Um, um, and static analysis, and I'm like just about out of time. So, um, so static code analysis is something everybody can, can do uh, via uh, the the free cloud service that I mentioned, or if they're working for a corporation, there's a number of um, of closed source solutions, uh, including HPs, that are really good that you can integrate um, into uh, various places in your development stage, either as part of an IDE or part of uh, like uh, your your CI server. You can run it as part of uh, Jenkins or something like that. Um, so, uh, so true static code analysis is an NP hard problem. If you're a uh, computer science buff, you probably heard of a halting problem. It, 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 it's the same kind of uh, problem. So basically, it gets around that by heuristics, um, pattern matching, and uh, basically coding rules. It kind of works in a similar way to a compiler, but uh, it, it does a little bit of extra to try to um, figure out uh, basically where tainted data could be flowing for the program. Uh, null pointers, um, uh, buffer overflows, and, uh, and, and such. So it's, it's doing a little bit uh, more work than with the compiler, but it kind of works in conjunction with it. So where to use it ideally? Um, use it at, in your IDE if, if you use an IDE at build time. If you have a huge project that you're compiling, it's, it's not really practical. It sometimes takes a while to run it. So you can run it as part of your, your um, continuous integration. Um, or uh, you can script it, you know, and, and basically you, your output was I'm going to show you, if hopefully you guys will bear with me a second, um, you get a report that you can then uh, review. Use early and often. Here's some, uh, some various options for you. There's um, a couple of open source options you can take a look at. Uh, I don't have any experience with these. If you care about the Magic Quadrant, uh, which I don't really, but you can see the, uh, the, the players there. Um, and, uh, and its limitations, it's, it's not going to find everything. And I'll give you a couple quick examples uh, when I show you this of uh, things that it missed. And it can only find problems in the code, not the architecture, of course. And there's some things that are just not obvious but to the, to the analysis tool because there's convoluted input paths and such. And it doesn't read your comments. <clears throat> um, so one nice thing about it, though, is new things come out. Uh, like, for instance, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, SSL um, vulnerability, they figured out a new pattern matching algorithm to try to detect similar type of, uh, of problems, which is essentially a buffer, um, off by one kind of buffer problem. And uh, so thanks. I'm going to show you a couple of quick um, uh, examples if you, don't, if you don't mind. Okay. Sorry, this is kind of awkward for me to see in this resolution. So this, uh, I've run a uh, report on my homework from like years ago <laughs> when I was learning how to do PHP. And uh, what you can see is it breaks things down into different categories of, uh, of problems and uh, critical, you know, high, et cetera. And then it gives you, uh, takes you right to the problem and the code. So 
Um, so here, for example, it's taking unvalidated input right from a, uh, from a uh, I guess this is right from a uh, uh, input field and just displaying it back. And it'll give you some uh, uh, details about why it, it and uh, give you some recommendations of how to fix it. So these are simple inputs, uh, simple problems that, that you can easily find. Uh, I'll show you a quick, uh, this is integrated with um, Eclipse. Uh, this is kind of how I like to use it. Uh, our uh, Fortify's um, Eclipse integration really only is good for Java right now. Everything else you kind of got to run outside and then bring it back in. Um, but it uh, gives you a nice little uh, toolbar, and uh, you can analyze the project, bring up your audit results there. And then, again, you kind of can switch right back and forth between your, app, your design and your, and your, um, your uh, results of your scan. <clears throat> and in this case, uh, my homework from a few years ago was pretty good, except uh, it took me to... Uh, a, um, an issue with uh, the encryption I was using, which after, and if I was a security reviewer looking at this, and, and it's actually not a low default, this is a high default because it's not using any sort of, um, of uh, uh, it's just um, SSH, uh, yeah, showing a uh, thing as encryption when that's not really encryption. should be at least uh, adding a, uh, um, some sort of um, other value to it. So anyway, um, and then let me show you two, uh, one other quick uh, so this is um, OpenSSL, an old version of it, uh, one of the vulnerable versions, 1.0.1. And in all fairness, uh, this Fortify would not have found this original bug, as I said, it does now find it. And uh, you can see it's right here. Yep. Yeah, I just lost it. <laughs> ah, there you are. Okay, yeah, that's the line right there, <laughs> the mem copy line. And uh, if you actually look at what's going on uh, here, you can see why it was kind of hard for it to figure out what, what was going on because um, it's not obvious that the uh, that that value came from a network source. But they figured out some way to do it, and, and this is kind of cool. It gives you a little diagram that shows you exactly where the taint came from, taint from the network. You can see there. If you understood how this worked, you could see you could try to. Um, if you actually understood the code, you could get some good insights from this. Uh, another thing I found interesting was the number of other critical vulnerabilities it found. Then, you know, and that's why you need to have a manual review on top of this because I can pretty much guarantee you most of these are, are, are probably nothing, you know, false positives. But who knows, you know, until you actually go through and, and look at it, uh, there could be a number of other vulnerabilities out there waiting for somebody to, to, to look at. And, uh, and one last uh, look at a failure of, uh, of it. Um, this is... Um, this is Drupal, uh, version 7. Now, this should be a vulnerable version to the SQLI uh, vulnerability, and you can see that they have zero critical vulnerabilities. Uh, it did not find this, um, and uh, this shows you, too, that the Drupal team does use static code analysis as part of their final build processes. So they pretty much make sure it you know, gets a pretty clean analysis back. So that you know that's good. But um, And again, and this is one of the ones where I've lost my place in it. <laughs> But um, if you look at the function, it's not obvious that the input is coming from a tainted source. So um, that, that kind of shows you where, you know, sometimes it, it, there's, um, you do need to do manual review on top of it. So that's all my examples. So I'll take any questions. I know I'm out of, completely out of time, but thanks for uh, your attention. Got some time for questions. Okay. I, have, I have one. Okay. Um, okay. Do you see a lot of difference compared to something like there's the like LLVM Clang static analysis ones? Is that sort of getting a pretty good sort of easy thing to go now that's open? Uh, or do we still get a large advantage from the proprietary ones? Oh, oh okay. Um, well, I don't have a lot of experience with the, the open source security oriented ones. If you're referring to like the ones that are kind of built into like the, the IEs. Well, not just security as well, just like correctness as well. Correctness, right. Yeah, so uh, security stuff does a lot on top of what the correctness ones do. So the correctness, uh, the comparison that, that I'll use it as is like a spell checker. And it'll, it'll, uh, it'll help you if you are, um, uh, are usually a good speller but you occasionally mistype something. But it doesn't do that deep analysis that some of these, tools, these other tools do. My understanding is that the open source, um, the first one I had listed here, I forget what it's called, is um, um, visual code grep is, is getting pretty good. Um, and then, as I said, the Coverity um, thing is nice, um, where you can create a project on their site, submit your code, and uh, get a report back. Um, it, it's, it's not as ideal as being able to integrate it into your, your own development environment, but um, 
you know, it's better than nothing. And then if you, uh, like, so there's probably, like, Hadoop, for instance, is, is, is on there. So you can sign up as a, um, so there's project controllers that really have, can do stuff with the, with the, um, um, the, the scan. But there's, you can also sign up as a reviewer, and anybody can do that. So you can review their, their code results back without having to pay anything or what have you. So that's really nice. I've been on the receiving end of a customer mailing Caverity reports and wanting answers of why these weren't fixed. <laughs> right, and you know, again, you probably see a lot of them and you're like, well, this is nothing, right? But, you know, it, 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 uh, it can help, especially it help guide somebody that, that, that's not uh, co-reviewers through the code, too, to try to, to, to pinpoint things uh, that, um, that might have been missed. And, you know, you can, um, well, if you're using, like, Fortify, you know, you can have it in a... Um, a collaborative environment, and you can and everybody can kind of get their feedback to say, okay, well, this is nothing, or this is that, or this is mitigated by X, Y, Z, and and um, you know you have a huge project that you're going back at, like Open SSL. That's going to be a huge task to do, but um, you know you're building something new is a really good opportunity to get this stuff in early, and um, try to have the principle is introduce no new bugs, at least no new SCA detectable bugs is a is a good good step. <clears throat> do we have any questions around the room? All right, well, thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs>